Good morning. The reading this morning is from the New Testament, and it's John chapter 9. It's entitled, Jesus Heals a, Bo a Man Born Blind. Hear the word. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is a day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am, the, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with saliva, put it in the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly, formerly seen him begging asked, is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes, and he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They, br they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was, was the Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees who asked him that he had, how he had received his sight he put mud in my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened, the man replied, he is a prophet. They still didn't believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they had sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one who say was born blind? And how is it thou now that he can see? We know he says our son, the parents answers, and we know that he was born blind. But how can he see now? Or who opened his eyes? We do not know. Ask him. He is of an age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. The second time they summoned the man who had been blind, give glory to God by telling the truth, he said. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you, you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you not want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as it for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening his eyes of a man born blind. If this is the man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard what they had, thro they had thrown him out. And when he, when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe him. Jesus said, You have seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe and worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, so the blind will see, and those who will see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, 
What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now you claim that you can see. Your guilt remains. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Much as I love Scotland, there are times when, in all honesty, I cannot say that I really enjoy the weather we have here. I absolutely adore those days when the sky is blue and you're standing up the top of a hill and you feel that you can just about see from coast to coast. Those days are beautiful with the hills rolling away in various colours of mauve and green away from you. Equally, I love the days in the winter where the snow has fallen and everything is covered in that brilliant white. You've got a blue sky above and there's a hush that's fallen over everything. It's almost as if the world has just slowed down to enjoy the weather, to enjoy that snow on the ground. My problem, though, is with the days when it rains. You know the days when it really, really rains? When the days where it seems to get in through every gap in your clothing... And an umbrella is rendered the most useless item going because, well, frankly, the rain's coming at you from all angles. We had one of those days on Friday a bit, didn't we, where you could really hardly see the end of the street because the air just seemed to be hanging full of water. That kind of foggy mist that's just so Scottish. And it really obscures your vision of the world around you. On days like that, there's just so much that we can't see while we might see some of the things that are near at hand, we just don't get the whole view of the world around us. It's out of sight. And I'm often sad when we have those kind of days, and I know there's visitors around, and I think, that's awful, going home, having never seen the true beauty of this place. Today's passage is a bit like that. It's about people seeing and seeing properly. There's folk in the midst of that story who are really missing the point. They don't see what it's all about. And the question is, what is it that's really obscuring their vision? And what sometimes obscures our vision too? This healing of the man born blind is one of the signs in John's Gospel that points to the true identity of Christ. Through this sign, Jesus, who's the light of the world is revealed as the one who gives sight and reveals the truth to humanity. It's just not everybody seems to see it. The method that Jesus chooses to use to heal the man's sight is one which really, I think, probably seems very alien and very strange to us. Our society tends to have very negative associations with anybody spitting. We don't like it. It's a kind of unhygienic thought. It's kind of something yucky about it. But when you read some of the books, they tell you that the culture of Jesus' time, spit was thought to be actually quite a beneficial thing. It had an, there was the idea that it might actually cure you of some ills and diseases. So maybe what we're actually seeing Jesus doing is using something that the people of his time would have expected perhaps a physician or a doctor to do to help cure them from an ailment. A bit like we wouldn't be surprised to see the doctor taking out a syringe and sticking a needle in our arm to try and get us past something that was wrong with us. Maybe there's something in the kind of familiarity of Jesus' actions that really reassure those that are around and see what he's doing. And maybe something in that also for the blind man that was really reassuring. Of course, it's not just spit, is it, that he puts into the man's eyes. He's used the soil, the dry soil around, and that spit to make a mud. And I just wonder if that mud is there to remind us of a story in Genesis 2. I'll read the bit from the message translation for you. God formed man out of the dirt of the ground and blew into his nostrils the breath of life. The man came alive, a living soul. Then the healing becomes something more than just Jesus and this man born blind. There's an illusion in there 
to the creator and to his creation. We read that after the man did as Jesus told him and went and washed in the pool of Siloam, that pool that its name means sent, the man went home and he could actually see for the first time in his life. And it was when he went home that he met his neighbours. And really the reception he got from them was really rather strange. You and I would reasonably expect, if we've lived in a street or a neighbourhood for a while, that our neighbours would recognise us by sight, even if they didn't know our names. However, for this man, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. His neighbours are confused. They don't know whether he is the man who sat and begged on the streets for a living. Some seem to recognise him, but many are just not sure at all. What is it that's getting in the way of him, them recognising him? Is his appearance, has it changed in some way? Did they have a difficulty understanding what had happened to him? Was that what was stopping them seeing who he truly was? Or was it that they'd never actually looked at him because, well, he was sitting on the street begging and do you look at somebody who's sitting down there? This kind of asks the question, are there people in our neighbourhoods that live in our city that are going unrecognised, people that we wouldn't recognise? They've effectively become invisible. There's a work of art that sits in the centre of Glasgow, just off Buchanan Street, in one of these really busy thoroughfares in Glasgow. It's life-sized, so it's a big thing. It's a good six foot long. But in many ways, it's so subtle that you can make your way past it and not even notice that it's there. There's a very ordinary-looking park bench, and on it is a figure bundled up under a blanket. The figure seems to be fast asleep. And you've got to stop and you've got to look and notice that sticking out the end of the blanket are two bare feet. And on those two bare feet are wounds. And when you stand and look at that, you realise that actually this you're looking at picture of Jesus. The sculpture is actually called the homeless Jesus. Maybe it's not just those who are homeless. How many others pass unnoticed by us on the streets? Might we just pray for God to open our eyes to those people that we might otherwise not truly see? We read about the woman at the well last week and about her testimony, which brought many other people to Jesus. But in this story, we're given a very different picture of what it is to testify to Christ. For this man born blind, even when he gives his first testimony, he's doing so in the picture, in the face of some opposition. People don't believe him. They doubt his words. They doubt who he is. You can imagine the questions running around that crowd of people standing there. Is he really who he says he is? Is that really the fellow who couldn't see last week? Is that the guy who was begging along the road? What can he see? And if he's cured, where is the man that cured him of this blindness? When the man was taken to the Pharisees to account for what had happened to him, the doubts and the disbelief just continued. We were told that the healing had taken place on the Sabbath. Now, the Pharisees had very strict laws about the kind of things you could and couldn't do on the Sabbath. And the healing would have fallen into the category of something that you just plain weren't allowed to do. So as the man tells the story of how he was healed... He was faced with a group of people who were really already divided in their opinion about not just the man, but about Jesus. How could somebody who came from God actually perform a healing on the Sabbath when it was against the Pharisees' rules? And obviously they knew, they thought, 
a lot. And if that person were a sinner, though, how could it be that they could ever produce such a miracle? That didn't seem right either. They were very perplexed as to just what was going on. And they asked the man, what do you say about Jesus? Well, it was your eyes that he opened. All the man had to say was, he is a prophet. He is a prophet. But still in the minds of the Pharisees, doubts remained. Still they had questions. And you wonder were they really open to hearing the answers that they were going to get. The man's parents were then called forward to speak. They were for, called forward to give account, but they just said, ask him. He's the one. Ask him. He's old enough. And as he came forward, the tone of the questioning becomes even more hostile. He was all but accused of being a liar. Give glory to God by telling the truth. We know this man is a sinner. But even under that kind of pressure, the man born blind stuck with his story. I was blind, but now I can see. In the face of insult, threats, and increasing pressures, he stuck to that belief that Jesus could only, only have come from God. He remained loyal to Christ. John tells us that the Pharisees had made a determination that anybody who acknowledged Jesus as Messiah was going to be put out the synagogue. And when they were finished with speaking to the man and didn't like his answers, they threw him out. We can maybe see a mirror of some of the kind of pressures faced by that man as he gave his testimony in the experience of Christians throughout history. Unfortunately, it's not just through history. The lived experience of many Christians around the globe today is to face harassment, violence, and abuse from the people they live amongst because of their faith. In many cases, these are people living in some of the poorest communities in the world. There is much that we need to open our eyes to here as well and to be truly concerned about. And this is maybe an area that we may wish to pray further into ourselves, asking for God's leading and God's intervention for these people. When we hear what happened, when he heard what's happened to the man, Jesus returned. At that point, it seemed that the man hadn't really totally connected up Jesus with the Messiah, the Son of Man. But at the moment that Jesus revealed himself as that one, the Son of Man, the one who had healed him, the man sees both physically and spiritually. The two things come together in his faith in Jesus. What Jesus had offered this man was a healing of his sight, but it was more than that. Now this story that we have in chapter 9 here flows over into the next chapter in John's Gospel. And it, in that section we hear about Jesus declaring himself to be both the gate for the sheep and the good shepherd. And two of the very famous I am statements in John's Gospel. In these two images of who Christ is, many promises lie both for that man, born blind, and for us. The Good Shepherd offers us a personal relationship as he calls his sheep by name. He leads them out and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. It is a very personal relationship that is offered. He promises I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The good shepherd is prepared to lay down his life for the sheep. Jesus, as the light of the world, shines into our lives. 
And in doing so, we may recognize some of the darkness that is within us, to which otherwise we would be entirely blind. We need that light to see ourselves as we really are, to recognize that we are sinners and we are in need of our Savior. Without Christ's presence in our lives, we wouldn't recognize just who we are. We would be blind to ourselves. We are called by him to let our whole lives stand as testimony. And as part of the church, we are called to carry on the work that he began so that the world can see a reflection of that light that he brings into the world through our lives. It's quite a big thought. Our entire life is to witness to Christ. That's every bit of our every day. Something in our lives should be reflecting the presence of Christ back into the world. This maybe begs a question, how does this change the way that we live? How does it change the way that we relate to other people? We all have skills and talents to give. Mine will be different from yours, which will be very different from the person sitting next to you. Again, very different from the person that lives in the house next to you. There are just as many skills and talents as there are people. Being able to put someone at their ease is every bit as important as being able to pour the teapot or sing and play a musical instrument on a Sunday morning. But it's more than just that Sunday morning, isn't it? It's everywhere that we go throughout the week, our workplace, our home, our schools, out and about in our community. These are just as important places in which to let people see the light of Christ in our lives. And it's not only in the good times of life, it's also in the difficulty that we can witness to Christ. Some of the most amazing witnesses to Christ have come out of people living through really difficult circumstances. We live in a world alongside folk who don't know Christ, who will be going through the highs and lows of life in the same way that we do. And as we witness, they may glimpse him through his, the work that he and God are doing in our lives. Remember that God is at work in all things. And it just might be that through the most difficult of times and the most unexpected of places that he finds the greatest of witnesses. As we walk through these days of Lent and preparation for Easter, let's find a bit of time in our day to reflect on our own lives and the kind of witness that we offer to Christ in all that we say and do. Let's pray. Creator Lord, who fashioned humanity out of the soil of the earth, the muddy clay in the hands of the potter, we give you thanks for who we are. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Help us to grow into the people you intend us to be. Open our eyes to ourselves so that we may realise our need for you. We may live relationally with you, seeking your guidance and listening for your voice. Help us to live well alongside one another, that our lives may reflect your light into the darkness of the world around. Help us to care for your creation, showing it the kind of love that you do, living our lives in ways that show care for and concern for both people and planet. We give you thanks for your son Jesus, our saviour, who taught us when we pray to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.